saying, uh, first off, great voice. Uh, and second <laughs> off, uh, talk a little bit about your experience in networking. It uh, well, I, the, the the voice I cannot claim the credit for. Um, <laughs> I, I give I give God the credit for that. I was just hopping along as sixteen years old, and next thing I know, I was ten octaves lower than. <laughs> so, uh, they moved me from tenor to bass in the concert choir, and that was the end of that. Okay, nice. Uh, the networking, however, I was not looking for it. It was uh, sort of foisted upon me because I went into the insurance business after leaving the military. I served in all my twenties in the military. And then I struggled to find the right work after I got out, uh, even though I had a communications degree. And eventually I said, you know, I've got to get a job somewhere. I've got a, I've got two kids and a mortgage. So I went into the insurance business and the second job I had, the uh, branch manager that I worked for said something I've never forgotten. He said, I don't want to see you in this office very often. And I was like, what do you mean? He said, if you are a field agent, that means you should be out in the field, going to community events, networking, meeting people, shaking hands, and gaining business through through relationships. And I'm 30, 33 years old when he tells me this, and I really didn't know what he was talking about. But I said, well, I got nothing to lose. If that's what he wants me to do, then I'll go do it. So I start looking for organizations to become a part of and uh, discovered several discovered networking was a big thing in the city where I've lived for the last 18 years. And uh, it sort of took off from there. I just began to learn it at first by bumbling and making mistakes, but I got better at it because I kept showing up over and over and over again. And is networking as vital today as it was back when you were starting? Um, and also in-person networking, is that as vital? I, uh, yes, unequivocally so. What I've found is that nothing trumps the connection between two human beings who are different from one another. One person is strong in one area, another is strong in another, both have weaknesses, they meet, they interact, they discover they can help each other or help each other meet the people that they need to know. And that's where uh, new wealth is created. That's where new value expands seemingly out of nowhere is the interaction of two human souls. So, you know, I think one of the things that you mentioned uh, prior to us getting on the call was digital networking, which is a great thing. I'm not at all opposed to it. I use it myself. This is what you and I are doing. Yet digital presents some inhibitions from what face-to-face -face does. And so I, I think there there is no replacing face-to-face -face interaction between two people. And when you do have to make some concessions to the digital world, um, what, what platforms do you choose to complement the in-person networking? Mostly I do everything on Zoom or Google Meet. I don't have a, uh, I used to host a podcast and so I did venture into some other uh, mediums for that. But for the most part, I rely on the same social networks that everyone does and the, and the same mechanisms that everyone does to facilitate that. There's a lot you can get done. I have done business with people in Australia and Europe through without ever having met them face to face. And we have great relationships. So it's not to say that you can't have great relationships, but it, but I do know from having later on met some of those people in person for the first time that something shifts you you're you're acutely aware of stuff that is new between you that wasn't and would not have come to light had you not met them face to face yeah i tend to agree with you there's definitely still something about the physical world that uh virtual networking has not yet replicated and may never be able to, but this is too good of an opportunity not to plug Popple, which is one of the best things about it, having a digital business card profile, is it gives you a face and a digital presence without pulling you into a network. So you can not look like a Luddite, um, but also not be pulled into the negative side of, of social. So that's that's a pretty cool thing about digital business cards in general. Um, 
As for how networking manifests itself with career development, uh, career advancement, can you give some examples of just how, how that works uh, beyond just the perception that networking equals immediately landing uh, your dream job, which doesn't, mm -hmm. is, is simply not always the case? Yeah, I would say that uh, there's an old rule then the best way I've heard it described is that proximity equals power. Now I'm self-employed and have been for the last five years. And, but what I would say is no matter what it is you're trying to achieve, whether you're trying to build up a business or you're trying to find, an, you know, the job that you're really after, then your, your network is your net worth, as we say in the business world. So much of the opportunity that is actually available to you is not advertised in the newspapers or in the classifieds because you don't know any of the people who are posting those ads. The real place you should be looking, the real classified section you should be looking is among the people you do know, the people who do like you, know you, and trust you, and would recommend you to somebody and saying, you know, here's, here's, here's my background and here's my experience. Who do you know? who might want someone like that working at their company is a very different question than here's my resume. What do you think? Even if you know the keywords and all the, the te technical and tactical ways to get around the, the filters and the automation that's that rejects, you know, 99% of the resumes, the fastest track is when people already know you or already have somebody that they trust who trusts you. You know, the CEO is looking for to fill this position and he turns to his COO and says, who do you know? Do you know anybody who might fit this? If he has him or he or she has implicit trust in that COO, then whoever that COO recommends is going to get a, a get on the inside track automatically. That's just a fact. And uh, I don't know how you research something like this, but I do know that research shows that most of the jobs that are filled are never posted anywhere. It's just through mm -hmm. conversations exactly like you're expressing. Um, okay, so let's say we have somebody, they believe in networking, uh, maybe they even consider themselves a extroverted person who's naturally good at networking, but they don't know where to start. What advice would you give? The first place I always look is where do I at least know somebody who can introduce me? So I don't have to show up awkwardly by myself. And I've done this, right? So this is not me. This is me. Take it from the voice of experience. I have gone to networking functions by myself unknown. And I've I've done okay with it. I've, I've built relationships anyway. I've walked right across that barrier because I'm not afraid to talk to strangers. Uh, I wouldn't categorize myself as a loud, life of the party, extroverted type of person. But back in my 30s, I was very energetic and willing to go anywhere that I was welcome. I learned that, however, that being welcome doesn't always mean what I think of when I think of welcome, right? It, it actually means we we're open to anybody, but we would much prefer somebody brought by one of our existing members. Because again, it goes back to, are you preoccupied with promoting yourself or are you preoccupied with promoting others? If you're preoccupied with promoting others, that's a good sign. If you're preoccupied with promoting yourself, it's risky. It's not always bad, but it, it, it can be risky. And so the, the very first thing I would tell anybody is, who do you know who already belongs to a group you would likely be interested in going to? Okay, there's, there's two sort of people that I have in mind. There's someone who let's say real estate because it's just you can't argue against the value of in-person networking for real estate is just so clearly valuable let's say you're in that industry you know that in-person networking is incredibly valuable but you're a little shy um what advice do you give to that person yeah that, in fact one of the first networking groups i ever belonged to was the multiple listing sales association of thurston county where i lived and i went there because i found it online nobody invited me it was ten dollars for breakfast it was a seven it was a morning group 
And it was about 60 or 70 mixture of realtors, mortgage lenders, and then affiliates, all of the contractors and people who are ancillary to the industry. And I, that's where, oddly enough, that's where I made some of my first bumbling mistakes. I was just sort of trying to hard sell insurance and people were like, you know, turned off by that and scared of it and get away from me and that kind of thing. But they didn't kick me out. And I figured out pretty quickly, okay, they don't want to talk about insurance and they don't want to be hassled about it. So it's time for me to shut up and listen and find out what they do want to talk about, what they do want to know about. And for a, a little while, I didn't have anything. Now, this is this is mid-2013 going into the fall. So it's about a year after, uh, in 2012, Congress attempted to pass a Flood Insurance Reformation Act, which effectively meant that the flood insurance premiums provided by the federal government on homes that were located in flood zones were going to go through the roof. And I was paying attention to this, and so an opportunity they had an opportunity every week you could volunteer to speak on a topic and i said this is a topic real estate agents would want to know because there are floodplains near where we live and people do buy houses in them and they are represented by some of the people sitting in this group so i got up there and i talked for about three minutes and i said this is what congress is doing this is what's going to happen if you have deals in any of these areas and i had a list of them get out of them or let your clients know, let's look at something else. Let's cancel the contract because their flood insurance premiums are going are gonna to go through the roof in about 30 days from now. And after I was done, I had, you know, 10 or 15 people come up and say, thank you so much. I had no idea this was happening. Or I, I'd heard about this, but boy, you just, you just spelled out this. We're in trouble, you know. And that was the first time one of the people there who was an affiliate came up to me and said, really great presentation and by the way i'd love for you to look over our family's insurance pro portfolio and see if you could give us some competitive quotes and she became a client and i was like i just struck gold by focusing on things that are important to other people to the entire audience in in the group that's great advice it's just uh within content marketing it's as straightforward as just giving people the information they want uh rather than having to think you constantly have to hit the nail on the head with describing your sales and your services and things like that just sometimes just lead with information and uh okay so so how about person two this this person's also in real estate they have the thousand kilowatts smile uh maybe they're worried about not being shy but coming off as inauthentic uh, what, what advice do you give to that person? I have a chapter in my book devoted to this uh, called The Curator. And I'm actually going to be putting out a new version of it pretty soon. I don't have any details yet. I'm just working on the draft of it right now. And most of the time when we think about curators in the modern sense, we think either of museum curators or we think of curated groups where the membership is selective, is you know, handpicked and all that kind of thing. What I tell people is, no, you got to you got to go deeper than that. You got to curate yourself. You got to pick and choose who you want to be and how you want to show up. And and the way the best way I've found to do that is to say, if I were suddenly invited into a room full of fifty of my absolute bullseye target clients, I mean, just people that I know have got the ambition, the budget, the willingness, they're just looking for the right person to help them get their book published and all that. What can, who do I need to become and how do I need to show up to walk out of that room with phone numbers and, you know, pledges of getting started and all of the things that I really want when I walk into that room so that even if I don't walk out with anything, I know that I showed up as the kind of person that they're, those people are going to say, when the time is right, I'm going to do business with that guy. If you're loud, extroverted, or if you're quiet, if you're fly on the wall, you have to ask yourself that question before you get to the room. You ask yourself after you've shown up in the room, it may be too late. You've made a first impression already and you may have to go find another room. Or like me, you may have to just go quiet for a while and wait until the time is right to speak. But the bottom line is there is somebody that that room is looking for. Certain people in that room are looking for. If you can, if you can get to the bottom of who that is and you match that profile, 
then it's going to work. And what are the most important skills for a networker? Um, are those skills innate or can they be learned? I learned them. They were utterly foreign to me. I was, you know, I, I, I don't like to sound critical here, but most people, including many people who show up to networking, don't, don't really see very far past their own nose. And, uh, that's just that's just a natural human condition. We're much more interested in what we we care about and what we want to do and who we think you know all that kind of stuff. And that's great. I don't I don't begrudge people's self interest. I've just learned to pay more attention to it than the average person does. But I was as preoccupied with my own little world as anybody else when I started. So yeah, uh, can it be innate? Absolutely. Are there people who are just born gifted with a other centric? emphasis throughout their lives? Yes, no question. Um, but this is learnable. So it sounds to me like um, the most important networking skill is just the ability to put oneself in someone else's shoes. Not far off. Yeah. Dale Carnegie said that. He said, we are interested in others when they are interested in us. I mean, and and if I think about even the interaction that you and I are having, right? I'm jazzed because you're interested to know what I think. Plenty of people out there I can find who aren't interested in what I think, you know, not many who are. So I want to talk to people who are interested in what I think. Sure. Because I'm not interested in what other people are thinking about. I'm interested in what I'm thinking about. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How do you nurture the networking relationship beyond the initial connection to actually turn it into something of value? Yes, I love the uh, expression. I used to use this expression. I called it relationships with lift. And when what I, what I think the mistake some people make when they go to a group setting, right, where there's 30 people in a room or however many, is that you're going there to transact business. And that's not the case. You're going there for business reasons, but not to transact business. The transaction takes place further along in the sequence of the relationship. The same way you don't, you know, a woman never accepts a marriage proposal on a first date, right? So there's a process you go through. There's a conversation that has to happen. And the networking group is sort of a launch pad for that. It's the opportunity to meet people, have a brief conversation, exchange business cards, and then say, you know, you send them an email separately. I'd like to get together and, and or, or, you know, hop on a call or something like that to find out how we might benefit each other. So you're totally honest. Yes, I do have a self-interest, but I not I don't only have a self-interest. I'm also interested in seeing who can I connect you with or how can I advance your cause? And in the process, my own will be advanced as well. So being um, too self-interested, being too forward really is, is definitely one of the major mistakes that people make. What, what are some of the others? I think uh, going there, uh, you know, as you said, going just openly self-interested. Another one is going there and playing all your cards to the chest and being a fly on the wall and not sharing for fear that, you know, people will not appreciate what you had to say or that kind of thing. The truth is all of us have stories and uh, experiences that can be valuable. All of us have the ability to pay attention to what's going on in our local marketplace and share useful information. All of us know people who maybe we cannot help someone and get paid for it, but we know someone who can help them and get paid for it. And we can create synergies between two, two separate people who don't know each other. One is standing right in front of us in the group. The other one is out somewhere, but we know them, right? And so you, this person comes to you and says, I have this problem. I'm not sure what to do about it. Oh, I know just the person. I know just the person. And do I get paid anything out of that? Most of the time, no. Sometimes somebody will slip me a couple hundred bucks as a thank you for a referral, but that's that's not going to butter my bread. You know, what is going to butter my bread is the reciprocity that generates that I don't even see coming because I'm just too busy focusing on helping other people get what they need.
And what if the value starts to seem very one-sided? Let's say that you were a coder, you know, today to some degree, but especially a few years ago where every business slash marketing person wanted to, uh, you know, just pay you an equity rather than giving you actual cash. Basically, you were bringing all the value to the table. What are some graceful ways within a networking relationship to step away from those time wasting scenarios? Yeah, yeah. Well, if somebody were to approach me on such, in fact, I have, I have had people approach me on uh, on such a footing and say, I, I can't pay you to do this, uh, but I'm willing to share revenue with you. I might entertain it, but but most of the time, opportunities like that are very, very difficult to say yes to, particularly if you yourself are not doing so well. That's something that really should be pitched to investors who have more money than they know what to do with. And since everybody's already pitching to them, good luck being heard, but, that, but that's beside the point. If they're pitching it to me, and it's not something I can afford to invest in, I'm gonna say something like, I really appreciate you thinking of me. And I think there's something to this. I think I don't think that this is a waste. If I do this, it will be, I can see it being cost prohibitive, counterproductive. It'll, it'll take me away from my mission, my mission and vision rather than toward it. And I can't do that. Somewhere that I'm going. If I come now, I may know someone who, this is a good fit for it, in which, in which case I'd be happy to introduce you. That's all I can offer you right now is is leveraging my network. Can't go wrong with that. I mean, who could argue with it? Um, what about like any mnemonic devices or, or just small tips and tricks for remembering names and, and the little things that have to do with networking? You know, remembering names, I mean, it's a great thing, right? That, because everybody loves the sound of their own name. I didn't find it helpful. Just because I know someone's name doesn't mean I've spent any time getting to know them. There's a lot of people whose names I still remember today. And I'm like, you know, I never really got to know that person. I just remember their name because I remembered their name because I saw them all the time. But I never really got to know them. Here's what I would say. There, there are some excellent um, conversational techniques I've learned to really get a rolling conversation going, with, especially with the right people. And they have to do with the fact that often a mistake we, another mistake, since you asked about mistakes that we make in networking, is assuming, is not assuming, not perceiving our fellow human beings correctly. So whatever we're perceiving them as, we are not conditioned to think of them as living, breathing stories. And yet that's exactly what they are. If you think about your own life, for example, you are a com compendium of one story built upon another, upon another, upon another, up to and including today. Now, we don't have to go as far as getting each other's entire autobiographies from day one. But we can certainly inquire in very broad, general terms about recent history, current activity, and near future events. And here's what I'm talking about. When I meet somebody at a networking event, one of the first questions I try to get in after the pleasantries have been exchanged is, tell me something that's going really well for you lately. And, I, and it never fails. Every person I've ever asked that question can answer it. Well, I, I, I got a new account the other day, or my son just graduated high school, or my wife and I just returned from our 20th anniversary trip, or whatever it is, right? They can all re reference something in the last few weeks that's been really, that's gone really well, that they're really pleased with. And that gets them, that, that gets the conversation just a little bit below surface level. Now you're not doing the surface chit chat. You're asking something that's a little bit more intimate, but not inappropriately intimate. Right. And then the next question you ask them is, tell me something that's not going so well, maybe a, a big challenge or a difficulty or something that you really wish you you had the answer for right now. And you don't. And this is where you get your notebook out, either your mental notebook like I would, or you might even write it down. Now, you might even ask, do you mind if I write that down? I may know someone who could help you with that. Right. 
but they'll tell you everybody's got a challenge they're dealing with. Everybody's facing a difficulty or a struggle or a problem. And sometimes they'll go on it, just let them talk, let them talk, right? Ask them follow-up questions to that. So how's that affecting your role? What, what's, what's, what is this problem preventing you from doing that you could be doing, right? You can ask, you can be like a journalist and keep digging the, more, the longer they talk. And then the final question I would tell people to ask is, what are you looking forward to? You've just taken them through the valley, bring them back on a high note and let them think about the near future, something that they've got that they're excited about, that's about to happen, that they're, they've been anticipating for a while, right? And leave them on a positive note. But those three questions, I have never asked them of anybody and have not got any answers or have had people tell me, you know, go jump in the lake or whatever. Nobody has ever refused to answer those questions. How do you cultivate diversity within a network? It's it's easy for anyone to slip into surrounding themselves with people that are very similar to themselves. Uh, but I do believe the world and the business world has recognized the value of diversity that can be measured in dollars as well as many other ways. So how how is that something you address, diversifying your network? It's a good question. For me, I always took diversity for uh, for granted, as in I assumed it was diverse from the start because of what I mentioned earlier. Uh, I look for people who are similar but different. I look for people who whose whose diversity lies in the fact that they may be in a completely different industry, they may have a completely different skill set, they may have a completely different degree of tolerance for certain things that I have no problem with, or other things that I find extremely pet peevish, and they're like no big deal. Um, so there's all sorts of ways to measure that. I think when you get to talking about things like uh, financial levels and all that, and, uh, and and of course the, the demographic aspect of it, I, I do my best to remain open. I, I do my best to be inquisitive about everybody that I meet. Because the one thing that unites us, no matter what... Uh, no matter what our income or our background or heritage or gender or anything else uh, is that there's a story there's a story that is waiting to be told it just requires somebody who can shut up and listen long enough to to ask after it and it'll get out after that and i've been amazed how well i've been able to connect with people who I can tell from what they post on social media or what they even talk about from time to time. I disagree with this person. I, I, I would, if, if we were to get into a, a discussion of politics or religion or any other controversial subject, we would be on opposite ends of the aisle. But because I've chosen to engage them at the level of story, we're way deeper than that. And we can actually get along quite well. I love that. I know exactly what you're talking about. Is there any networking tactics that um, were common or, or worked well early in your career, which have just gone out of style and don't work anymore? I think just the stuff that keeps people on the surface, but I think that's always, I don't know that that's ever been in style, right? Maybe it was, maybe there was such a shared social fabric at one point that it, it it took no more than exchanging of business cards and there wasn't as much demand for knowledge and understanding upfront before making a decision. Maybe that's just the way it was. You had to take more chances back in the, uh, in the days prior to the internet, but it's certainly out of style now. It's certainly out of style to be a, a pushy or, you know, it's certainly out of, it was never in style to be pushy. It's also out of style to be, loud and braggadocious and uh and and hoping that you can just you know exert sheer force on the room and they'll gravitate towards you it doesn't work that way and i would say even if that is your natural tendency there's something to be said for learning to dial that back because 
when to, to engender the kind of trust, right? Trust is the currency we're after from networking, not money. Money is a byproduct of trust. So what you're really looking for is to engender that kind of trust. And the way you get to that level of trust is by being receptive to their story, inquisitive about thoughtful, giving good feedback, trusting people, attention, how much you can have attention. Great stuff, great advice for networkers in just about any industry from Paul Edwards. Paul, let me give you the last question here. Could you paint the picture of the future of networking? Where is the networking world headed and uh, what trends are you seeing? I think there is an effort to bring back in-person networking after the pandemic, which I think is heroic. I think the people who take advantage of the vacuum created by that, where a lot of people disappeared, uh, will will get the inside track from building relationships. I think digital networking is here to stay and it's useful, especially when you're divided by enormous uh, tracts of land or ocean. You have to do it that way. But I, but I would say that the person who does both and adapts to the things that change without forgetting to remain wetted to the things that never change, which is the importance of face-to-face -face human connection and authenticity and vulnerability between people. I think that that person is positioned to win uh, the greatest. Great. Well said, Paul. Appreciate your time. Thanks, Gerald.